Heavenly Father, uh, thank you, God, for um, just the life that you've blessed us with. Uh, Father, thank you for uh, placing us in a free country to freely gather and worship you, God. Thank you for redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you for mercy when we did not deserve it. Uh, God, I pray uh, that you would be with us tonight as we open your word. Uh, as we learn from you, God, I pray that you would uh, teach us about marriage, about the roles of husbands and wives. I pray, God, that your word would reveal great truth to us, uh, that we'd be inspired by it, to live by it, to walk by it. Father, I just pray for everything that is going on here this evening. I pray for the preschool and nursery downstairs. Uh, just give them a sweet time around their lesson and uh, their songs and craft that they will do, uh, learning simple truths, but great truths of God and Jesus. And I just thank you for teachers who are with them tonight. I pray for the elementary kids. Uh, for those that have come in on buses uh, from various backgrounds, God, who come from uh, various homes, I pray that the elementary teachers and the small group leaders would be able to communicate to them uh, the truth of who you are and that they would learn and that uh, perhaps be a light in the home that they'll return to later tonight. I pray for the youth group, uh, for the message that they will hear. I pray that uh, the truth of your word would challenge them and begin calling them out, that they would begin making decisions uh, for the future of their lives based on the word and the truth of Jesus Christ. God, we're thankful to be here. I'm thankful for the fellowship that we have, the unity that we have through Jesus Christ. Thankful for believers around the world, those who stand in intercessory prayer, those who are uh, in dangerous places advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ, those who are uh, giving their life. God, those who may be breathing their last and coming before you tonight. Uh, how humbling to think of someone giving everything they have for the cause of Jesus Christ. Uh, God, I pray you just be with us here. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5, there is probably not a greater passage in the Bible that deals with marriage than what we're going to cover tonight. Uh, I, I, I want to just say, before we get into this, uh, to husbands and to wives, um, I, I care for you all, and I love you all, uh, and I... As Wes and Brian, as, as teachers and preachers of the Word of God, we are committed to preaching the truth no matter what that means. Uh, and tonight, I'm afraid that it means saying a lot of things that are probably going to cause our, our brains and our minds to hurt. Uh, as we look at God's design for marriage, we are going to look at things that are counter-cultural, that are even counter-American church cultural uh, simply things that we maybe we want to look away from, but truths in the Word of God that we cannot avoid because they are true from the Word of God. Uh, so I ask you for uh, not patience and grace in listening to me. I ask you for patience and grace in opening your heart and listening to the Word of God tonight and perhaps changing the way you think about various things in the Word of God, perhaps changing what you think about uh, marriage and the roles of husband, the role of wife, I know that in the room we are talking to people who are married, people who want to be married, people who have been married. Uh, there, there is a, a great, when we gather in a room like this, there is a great spectrum of people that gather. I know there are young people in the room who may be thinking that marriage is not for them. Uh, that's okay. You can still learn about what the roles of married, what married life is supposed to be because there may be a situation or a circumstance where you need to speak the truth of the word of God to someone around you about their marriage. Uh, there may be young people in the room who are like, that's me. I want to be a husband. I want to be a wife. I want to grow someday. I want to be married. What do I need to do? What do I need to be? Uh, there are those of you who are married. Maybe you have a good marriage. Maybe it is rocky. Maybe it is awful. Uh, then you all need to pay attention because no matter how good your marriage may be, if you're telling me that you've got to a place where you can't learn or grow anymore, then we need to go to another place and talk about different things. I just, there's always room to grow. There's always room to learn that you've fallen short and there is a standard of holiness and godliness to pursue. Uh, if your marriage is in trouble tonight, I hope that you will listen very closely to the word of God because it has become my belief and I hold heavy to the convictions that for every marriage that is struggling, there is found in this passage of scripture here the means to solve whatever that issue may be. Uh, from, from the hardest of circumstances, I understand that you may be here tonight, a spouse without the other, maybe a wife, maybe a husband, here without your husband, without your wife. I understand that you may be in the room tonight uh, and you may be wishing that they were here, like this message is for them. Maybe it's not, maybe it's for you tonight. Maybe it is a message that God is trying to get to you to reveal to you that there is something that you need to work on in your life. Perhaps you're in the room and you've lost a spouse a grief that I don't understand. 
and I'm going to pretend to. I think there are still beautiful things, though, for you to look at concerning marriage and the Word of God and how that relates to you and your relationship with Jesus Christ. We're going to read a verse tonight that will say, we'll get to it a little later on, and we're going to read a verse that says this mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. There is not a greater illustration in the Bible of the relationship of Jesus Christ to the church than marriage. Marriage is such a beautiful illustration of the love that Jesus has for us, and in that, there is an order and a design that God has got for marriage. So let's... let's uh, Remember where we've been just a little bit uh, in chapter 5. We were in chapter 5 last week. Be imitators of God as dearly beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you. Talked about what imitating God looks like in our life. What things uh, do not belong in our life. Paul lists several things. Sexual immorality, impurity, and greed. They should not be named among the children of God. We talked about uh, various ways to live. I gave last week five uh, ways to walk a manner worthy, pleasing to God. Ephesians 4.1 says, live a life worthy of the manner, or worthy of uh, the calling that you have received. And Ephesians chapter 5 starts to list uh, ways that we can live. We live a life of love. We live visibly before people live as light, not as darkness. We live as wise, not as unwise. We live thankfully, peacefully, humbly. And then we come to the verse that we ended with last week. And it's important to start here. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 says, And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. The fear that is used here is the reverential fear, in the worship of, in the awe of, to be subject to one another in reverence to who Christ is. I want to talk about that word, the third word of the verse, and be subject. Uh, some of your Bibles may have the word submit and submit yourselves to one another. The word subject. There's an old Greek word, uh, and I don't speak Greek, so I'm not going to attempt to use the word. Sometimes I do that, and I'm just like, I'm not a Greek guy. But I do like to look into words, and words that they wrote, and what did they mean by that word? Words that we don't lose meaning for when we use them, but what was the word they used? Because sometimes it's much stronger. Sometimes we look at what a Greek word was, and, and what they would have written, the word that Paul would have actually written, and we'll find that there's much more stronger language from that word than just subject or submit. Uh, it is an old Greek word, an old military word, and it's actually two words uh, put together that simply means to place yourself under. To place yourself under, to fall uh, in line with, to arrange behind, an old military word. I started thinking about uh, you know, military formations. I grew up in a family that was exposed to the military. I've had uh, friends and family that have been in the, the military, Army, Marines, and uh, always been a fascinating thing to me. I, I never joined the military myself. I would just watch. Sometimes I watch videos of the silent drill team. I'm like, man, I wish I could fling a rifle around. Like, oh, look at those guys. It's impressive. Just to watch the formations. Some of you may be military service in the room. Just to watch them move with formations. A, a group of men, be it 10 or 50 or 10,000, just to watch them move in one motion. And that's happening because there is a leader telling them what to do and telling them how to do it. And they are listening to him and they are all moving together. And he says, stop. And they stop. He says, go. And they go. He says, turn. And they turn. They, they're just, they're moving on the words of the commander. They are subject to, they have fallen in line with, fallen behind, arranged themselves behind, placed themselves under. Subject. Subject to one another. Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. What is that talking about? There is an order among humanity by the design of God. There is an order to be maintained. Like we're not just down here. Like we, we see what happens in the world when there is no order. We see lawlessness. You go home tonight. If you've never seen lawlessness, then go home tonight, get online and, and watch the latest news clips of things that are happening throughout the world. Lawlessness has no order. Those are people who do not follow God. They do not subscribe to uh, the teachings of Jesus. There, there is lawlessness. There is no order. They're not subject to one another. Uh, among us, among believers in Jesus, in our humanity, there is an order that is designed by God that we need to observe. Observe. And the Bible says that we need to observe that in the fear of Christ. Because of who Jesus is, we look at the order that God has placed on this earth and we say, because of who Jesus is, I will submit to these varying authorities. So what are we talking about? There are, there are different authorities within, the, within our lives that we come under. It should be understood that when we talk about this, this is not always a voluntary ordering. Uh, so children to parents, 
You can't pick your parents, right? You're born into a family, you get a couple parents. You can't pick who they are. You're, you're born into the world. God brought you into a family. Uh, so what do you do? Well, then you have the decision because of those parents that you received to either subject yourself voluntarily to them or to rebel from them. Uh, so there are, there are children. Ephesians 6, uh, verse 1. I don't think we'll get there tonight, but it says in Ephesians 6, verse 1, children obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Verse 2, he says, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, the promise being that it may go well with you and that you may live long on the earth. That is a subjection. The child born into a family saying, I will respect, I will submit to the authority of my parents because God brought me into this family. I will grow up under them. We have the example of Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 2, verse 51. Not on the screen. I'm just going to reference these for you. Uh, the Bible tells us that after Mary and Joseph found Jesus who had left them, which is one of my favorite stories of the Bible. Like, I, I just love the story. They're in Jerusalem, and all of a sudden, Mary and Joseph are traveling back, and I, I wonder what that conversation was like. Sometimes, Jacqueline and I left a kid in the van one time for like a half an hour at home, and didn't take us that long. It says that Mary and Joseph were like a long ways away from Jerusalem. Like, Jerusalem to, Jerusalem to Nazareth is a long distance to travel, and all of a sudden, was, was it Mary or Joseph that realized that the child wasn't there? Like, where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? Where's, where's Jesus? Like, what, which one of them was like, what do you mean, where's Jesus? I thought you had him, right? Parents in the room, you're like, oh boy, I've been there, done that. <clears throat> they, they lost him. They go and they find him. One of my favorite stories, they find him in the temple and they find the teachers and the scholars gathered around him. They were marveling at the boy, at the things he was saying, right? Because even though he was a boy, even though he was fully man, he was a boy who was fully God. And I just, I just marvel about those, man, what on earth are we talking about? Fully God teaching them. It says that they took him when they left Jerusalem. The verse, uh, Luke 2.51 says, and he continued on in subjection to them. What does that mean? He as a child chose, what does the Bible say? That Jesus was tempted in all ways as we are, yet was without sin. So in his humanity, he continued on in subjection to his parents. I will learn from my parents. People are like, I wonder if Mary and Joseph had to teach the baby Jesus thing. Sure they did. They were parents who knew they had to raise him up. There is a likelihood. I mean, they, they take him to the temple for circumcision, as was the custom of their law. They're, they're, they had the celebrations as he grew up. He would have memorized and learned and read the Torah. He would have gone to synagogue, to temple. He would have observed these things as a Jewish boy growing up in a Jewish family. It says he continued in subjection to them. Many of us in this room understand a child that does not continue in subjection. Like, and then you try and correct them, like good parents seek to correct a rebellious child. What are you trying to correct? You're not trying to correct the rebellious child. You're trying to train a future adult. Now, this isn't going to be a parenting lesson tonight, but for all of you who have children, uh, myself included, you ask my wife, I tell myself this often, we talk about this all the time, we're not raising good children. We are raising future adults that need to be responsible, that need to be competent, that need to be polite, that need to know and fear the Lord. Like they're going to they're gonna grow and one day I'm going to weep many tears and let them go off to what God has called them to. It is my job to raise them in that. And children being subject to parents. There are slaves and masters. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 5 says, Slaves be obedient to your masters. Uh, I look at this and I'm like, well, slavery we don't have in the way that we've always thought of it in America, we, we think of slavery, we think of, uh, you know, maybe the Victorian era, maybe the 1800s, maybe earlier, where we would buy and sell people and they would, they would be subject to service, they would be owned property. Uh, that, that doesn't exist here. So when I read this, like, what does this mean to me? Slaves, I'm not, I'm not a slave. When I read this, uh, it's very easy for me to see employer and employee, right? So employer and employee, like, you have a boss, that you subject yourself to. Uh, Sir, I would like to work here. Okay, I will pay you this wage. Okay, I will give you my service for the wage that you will pay me, and you submit to his authority. Some people are like, you don't understand, I don't like my boss. He's a jerk of a man. Well, then maybe you should consider a new job. Maybe you should consider a new line of employment. But as long as you are there, you are to honor Christ. That's what uh, slaves and masters will. And then there are masters later who are told also, like, stop threatening, stop beating, don't do these things to your slaves. Like, it's just not what we know in our own American historical mindset. It's just not slavery that we understand. Yes, sometimes it looked like that. There are masters being told, you have a master over you. Like, treat them well. There, there's, there is subjection. There is an order to humanity. Romans 13, one that challenges me quite frequently. There are citizens placed under government. 
We in America are citizens of the United States of America. We have a free voting system. We have candidates who run. We have candidates we choose. We cast a ballot for. If they receive the most votes or however it actually works, they are elected to an office. Uh, and we are subject to the leadership that is over us. We, we don't speak badly about them. We don't uh, disown them. We don't try to uh, fight against them. We simply say, God calls me to a higher standard. You are an authority appointed by God, elected by man, but let's face it, that person got there because God allowed it to happen. There is no authority. Or you read Romans 13 if you want to check me. There's no authority that it is in existence that has not been placed there by God, allowed to be there by God. So there are children to parents. There are um, slaves to masters, employees to employers. There are citizens under government. Be in subjection to one another. In the church, there is an order. In, in the church, there are pastors. The people come to you and, and they're like, I, I'm under the authority of the leadership of this church. There, there's uh, an elder leadership. And I submit to their teaching. They are, they are godly men. They pursue the Bible. They teach the Bible. I, I will submit myself to their teaching. I will learn. I will grow in my walk. And I will move on to whatever God calls me to. But there, there are order to things. I mean, all the time, all over the place, you think about, like, there is subjection in the grocery market. You want to check out, and you've got to get in the line and wait. You subject yourself to stand there and wait. But it all takes a big turn in verse 22. <clears throat> I do want to say this. If you've been following along, we've talked about parallel passages several times. Other passages in the Bible where you can see the same thread of teaching and see that the Bible is congruent, that it is not uh, just saying wild things in one place and it's never backed up anywhere else. So I do want to say this before I go any farther. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 through chapter 6, verse 9 is the full text. We're not going to read all of it tonight. Ephesians 5, 21 through 6, 9. The parallel passages are as follows. I encourage you to write these down, note takers. Colossians, that's Colossians with a C, like Colosseum. My dad used to always get Colossians and Galatians mixed up. I don't know, so now I'm like, I feel the need to tell the difference between them. Colossians chapter 3, verse 8 through 4, 10. Colossians 3, 8 through 4, 10. 1 Peter chapter 2, 13 through chapter 3, 9. 1 Peter, chapter 2, 13, through 3, 9. 1 Timothy, chapter 2, 9, through 3, 13. 1 Timothy 2, 9, through 3, 13. And 1 Corinthians 7. If you're note takers and you didn't get them, you didn't write them down, come and see me afterwards. I've got notes. I'd be happy to share those with you. Those are parallel passages to what we are reading tonight. Those are passages of scripture that you can go to and see the same principles taught from the same word of God and be like, okay, it's said in more than one place. I should be paying attention to what's being said. You should always pay attention to what's said in the Bible. When it is said more than once, you should pay very close attention. <clears throat> subject, submit to, be subject. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Wives, you are to be under the authority of your husband and no other man. You are to submit to your husband and his authority his leadership, his counsel, his guidance, his direction. You are to submit to your husband and to no other man. If you are married, wives, if you are married in this room, if you are planning to be married, young women, single women in the room, not, maybe, maybe not young, I don't know, single women in the room, if you are a single woman and you're like, I would like someday to be married, you should understand that your role as a woman when you become married is to submit to your husband. Wives, be subject to your own husband and to your husband only. No other man should have the authority that your husband has in, his, in your life. His word should almost be absolute. Now, we're going to read some other words in a minute that are going to put that into context because if there's one thing that we have done very well, we have perverted this verse. We have, we have ruined, and for any man in the room that's like, that's right, <laughs> amen, like, we're going to get to you guys, too. <clears throat> I have just about equal tolerance 
for wives who don't submit as I do for men who hold wives in submission. So we're going to get there. Wives, be subject to your own husband, to your own husband alone. Before God, always, it says, as to the Lord. Wives, you are subject and you submit to your husband's authority. But your ultimate authority is God in heaven, first and foremost, always, at all times. Always. You look to God the Father, and he is your ultimate authority. And God has ordained on this earth that if you are a married woman, your authority on this earth is your husband. We will get to, you don't understand my husband, you don't understand what kind of man he is, he does not believe we're going to get to all of that. Hopefully, this might be a two-week thing, we'll see what happens. Before God, men and women stand as equal. We are sinners, we need the saving grace of Jesus Christ in our life. We need faith in Jesus to receive the grace of God to be saved in our lives. Men, women, equal. Young, old, children, different nationalities, different skin colors, I don't care. All of humanity is the same before God. We are equal before God. Equally sinful and in need of salvation. All have fallen, all have sinned, all have come short of the glory of God. <clears throat> Jesus Christ came for the world. God gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him, <clears throat> we all need Jesus. We're all equal before God. But that does not mean that you are the same as man. This is where it starts to get a little difficult. Not for me, because I just am like the Bible says it. Equal before God, sinners, wives, those who would be wives, you are not the same as your husband. You are not given the same qualities. You are not given the same responsibilities. You are not given the same physical demeanor and stature in creation itself Wives, women, you were created differently than man. And I am not here in the least. You can talk with my wife all you want about this. I am not here to say that that in the least makes you as women inferior to me, to any man. That does not make you inferior. It makes you not the same. Equal before God, not the same among humanity. In the very story of creation, this blew my mind when I read it. I, 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 like, we know the story, right? We could talk about it. We could recite it from God created the heavens and the earth all the way through to the fall. We could recite the story, and we miss some things sometimes. All my life, I just, I've read it. I've gone over it. I've referenced it here, but I never paid attention to how women, in creation, you are created differently. You, you, you simply are not the same as man. Like, we can, we can snicker and chuckle and be like, yeah, we all, we all know that. But, but no, but grab what it really means. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. God has created everything, all the earth, everything exists at this point. He's created everything. <clears throat> he's created a man, he's put man in the garden, he's told him not to eat from the tree, when you do, you'll die. Verse 18, then the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I want to talk about that for a second. Men, you need help. Like men, men need help. Like, they're not the same as us, but we need help. God created everything. It's a funny point, but God created everything, right? And what do we read? When we read the story of creation, God created the heavens and the earth. God created the, the stars and the sun and the moon and the land and the vegetation, all the animals. And at the end of each day, God says, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. And on the seventh day, and it is very good. And now for the first time in creation, God says, it is not good for man to be alone. So then you're like, whoa, what does that mean? God made a mistake? No, no. Like who, then you have a distorted view of God if you're like, well, he made a mistake. He had to correct himself. <clears throat> the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Suitable helper, other, verses, other versions would say. Suitable helper. I will make for him a suitable helper. So very quickly in the design of women, we see the importance that they are to man. This is not to diminish women in any way. I don't want anything that I say tonight to be misconstrued as chauvinism or sexist or male domineering. Like, I don't believe in that garbage. This is simply what we see in the design of God. I will make a suitable helper. It's not good. I will make a suitable helper for him. We need someone to help us, like a, a helper. Ladies, a helper is not necessarily out in front of be careful where your help is at. Be careful in the way that you are helping. So we're like, I just, I gotta help him. I gotta help him. Make sure that I've got to help him isn't I'm gonna take the reins because he's fallen off the rails. 
Somebody's got to do something. We'll get to it. <clears throat> I'm a suitable helper. Verse 19, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was found, there was not found a helper suitable for him. I'm going to stop there for just a second. You catch what it said? Out of the dust of the ground. What else was formed out of the dust of the ground? The Bible says, God looked down and said, let us make man in our image. And he formed out of the dust of the ground man. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. That's incredible to me. I don't know if you've ever been down in the dirt and tried to make anything. <laughs> nothing but a, make nothing but a ball of dirt in your hand, I guess. God stooped down and took the dirt and formed it around and, and made man and breathed into his life. I love those words. The breath we breathe is not our own. God said, and gave us the breath of life. Wow, we could talk about that for weeks. Gave us the breath of life and man became a living being. It says he formed out of the dust of the ground every beast of the field, every bird of the sky. God's just like, and dog, and he brings him down. What's man going to call this one? What's man going to call that one? Whatever man calls him, God says, that's what it will be called. But there was no one found for man, no suitable helper found for him. So the Lord God, verse 21, caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. Did you catch that? Men out of the dust with the breath of life breathed into them. Woman, Adam, take a nap. I need a rib. Give me that rib. And out of that rib, God made woman. You are created differently. You're not created the same way as man. And that is not something to make you feel inferior. That is not something for man to lord over you. Ah, you're just a woman you wouldn't understand. You're just a woman, you're weak. We're gonna get to that stuff too. You were created differently. God had a different design for you as a woman. Created differently. Verse 22, the Lord God fashioned into, a, uh, fashioned into a, a woman, the rib which he took from the man, and brought her to the man. This is the symbolism that we use when a bride opens. Like you, you've been at weddings, some, some, some of you recently, the doors open and a bride comes down the aisle and stops with whoever man, brother, someone in the family giving her away and the pastor will say, who gives this woman to be married to this man? And then normally the normal response is, her mother and I, and the groom goes down and takes her hand and they come up. That, that's a picture of, of God bringing woman to man. It's a picture of that. The father is the authority of the daughter getting married, and he brings her down the aisle in a beautiful, tearful, oh my goodness, she's so beautiful moment. Brings her down to the groom who's sweaty and his knees are knocking. He's trying not to throw up. He's like, I'm getting married. And you're like, go get your groom. And he goes down and he gets the groom. God did this for Adam in creation. Adam is all alone. He's by himself. There's nothing, nothing around that is like him. He wakes up and God brings the woman to him. Adam says, verse 23, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken out of man. Created differently in the very creation of men and women different. For this reason, verse 24, for this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Verse 25, just for fun, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed because they were in the middle of perfection. In just a few short verses, Eve's gonna see the fruit, she's gonna take it, take a bite, give it to her husband. Adam's gonna take a bite and sin is gonna enter the world for all time until the final judgment just a few short verses, perfection gone, perfection ruined. And then the glorious news of Jesus Christ would follow. Created differently. Created differently. Men, as husbands, are told that you need to live, you need to live conscious of your wife as a woman. Like I, I, I remember being taught from a young age, you've heard Wes share this as well, that women are vulnerable. That you're weaker than men. I'm not trying to insult you. Some of you work out and are very physically fit, and you're probably more fit than me, and you probably take me to school on the basketball court, but that's neither here nor there. Women were created weaker than man. 
Because man was given a solemn charge by God to protect. Look at what men are told. Look at what husbands are told. Wives, for you wives, are like, hey, wait a second, I'm not weaker. No, 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 I'm not weaker. Like, I know there are strong-willed women. There are strong women. There's a, there's a fiber of strength that society is trying to weave into women. that says you're independent, do what you want. I don't know if God's with that idea or not. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 is what it says to husbands. You husbands, in the same way, Live with your wives in an understanding way as someone weaker since she is a woman. There is a sense, and I, I feel it now more than I ever did, with just my wife, there was a sense of, this is my bride. It still exists. This is my bride. And I defy someone to try and cause harm. I will defend at all costs. You know, men, we're going to get to why that should be our outlook and our attitude. I will do everything for. I will be everything I can be, and I may fail a lot of the time, but I will strive to be because of what God calls me to be. My wife is vulnerable in parking lots. She is vulnerable in grocery stores. She, with my children, is a target of predator and people that would prey on her. She goes to a, a mechanic shop. Women, this is a silly illustration, but understand the importance of it. You go to a mechanic shop and you're like, all I needed was an oil change. They told me that the, I need new brakes and the struts and the transmission and the oil and all that. They just took me to the cleaners because you are weaker and that is not bad. That is how God designed you. Men, perverted, God, ungodly, sinful men take advantage of you because you are weaker. So what happens? You take that car into the shop. Not gonna, a guy goes in and he's like, hey, I need an oil change. You're like, okay, we'll get you right in. Why do you think that happens? It's, it's, it's happened, you've experienced it somewhere in your life. This, this silly illustration has happened because women were created weaker, not inferior, not dirt and low and just go get in the kitchen and make food and why is the house a mess? Not inferior, not to be thrown about, not to be held down in subjection, simply created as weaker. And husbands are told, live with your wives in an understanding way because you are stronger than them. You can do things they can't do. In our society, the society is telling women everywhere, do whatever a man does. Anything a man can do, I can do better. I can do anything that a man can do. That is not God's design in marriage. You may be go able to go into the marketplace. You may be able to go into the corporate world. You may be go able to go into the classroom. You may be able to teach, lead, whatever. In your marriage, you are not the leader. You are subject to your husband and your husband alone. I learned from my wife recently who was reading a book about being an awesome wife because that's what she is. She just wanted to see if the author made any mistakes. <clears throat> and the author is talking about how, I love my wife. <clears throat> I'm so happy she's here tonight. The author was talking about how you may be the most qualified woman in the world. You may be the most qualified, more qualified than any man out there. You may be qualified. If you are in a marital relationship, you are not authorized to lead your home. That is wrong in the eyes of God. You are not given the responsibility of leading the home. And now you're like, well, okay, now, guy, you're saying crazy things. Can we move on? Absolutely, because the Bible gets crazier than me. Verse 23, half an hour on one verse. <clears throat> Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Why? For the husband is the head of the wife. If you were disputing, if you were building up doubts, if you were being frustrated and or angry with me, I direct you to the word of God. For the husband is the head of the wife. The husband has been given authority in the home. He is the leader. He is the defender. He is the protector. He is the provider. He is a decision maker. He's a dispute solver, a reconciler. The, the husband is the head of the wife. How? Of course, we're talking about godly men, women that are pursuing, being pursued by a man. He better be a godly man. If you're going to let yourself be pursued, woman, unto marriage, then he better be a godly man. Because if he's not, then we got to throw a lot of this stuff out the window. we got to go back to a different starting point. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ also is the head of the church. And I'm willing to let Christ lead the church because he does a better job than me. Amen. Wives, be subject to your husbands and to your husbands only, your own husband. Look what he says here. As Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. 
Verse 24, but as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be subject, so ought to be to their husbands in everything. You fall in line with the vision of your husband. You carry out the desires of your husband. You look at your husband and say, he is the man's most man because he's following God, and I will follow him, I will submit to him, I will subject myself to him as unto the Lord because he is pursuing God. You may be a woman in the room. We will address in a moment if you have a husband who is not a godly man. The Bible is clear for you as well. The husband is the head of the wife as Christ also is the head of the body, he himself being the savior of the body. I don't want to go to Creepville. I don't want to be grotesque. I please hope that you can grab the picture that is here. To any couples that have struggled in having children, please know that I am not saying this to cause harm to you. Please know that. I don't understand how God opens and closes the womb. We're not in control of that. Don't allow that hurt to change your eyes when you look at God. Husband is the head of the wife as Christ also is the head of the church, being the savior of the body. Christ is our savior. He saved us. Without him, we were incomplete. We were full of sin. The Bible, as we've seen, we were dead. We were lost. We were unreconciled. We were cast out. We were not a member of the family of God. And Jesus Christ died for us, reconciled us to the Father, and we are a family, the Savior of the body. The woman's body was given by God the means for reproduction of life. When husband and wife come together and God blesses that union, which he does whether there are children or not, let's not look at children as the mark of a healthy marriage. I sit with plenty of people who have children who are in disasters of marriages. Let's stop looking at a marriage and say, look at, they've got five kids. They're so perfect. Their marriage is so great. It might be a shambles. But when husband and wife come together, the husband has brought to the wife something that she could not have on her own. Savior of the body. I, I, I looked at that earlier. I'm like, man, it's just, just a picture, just a picture. I don't want to get deep into me. Just a picture of the responsibility of a godly husband, savior of the body. The wife is incomplete without that. And so are many men. I know that my wife is a completing factor to my life. Some men can live and remain single. I could not. And my wife is a complementary aspect to my life. I can't even imagine life without her. <clears throat> Wives, you are to place yourself under the authority of your husband. Single women in the room, if you are not ready to submit to the authority of the husband, then you need to reevaluate your relationship with God. You need to reevaluate where you stand. If you hope someday to have a husband, if you hope someday to be married, you have to learn submission to God because you will enter into a marriage relationship where God calls you to submit to your husband. And if you have not first submitted to the Lord, how do you expect to submit to a husband? As to the Lord, you submit unto God. I look at this, like when we talk about like, what do you mean I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, like, I gotta fall in line with the desire of my husband? What are you talking about? Like I don't, he's not a visionary, maybe he's not. He's not a dreamer, maybe he's not. He's not a leader, maybe he's not. But the Bible says that you submit to the husband as to the Lord. And when we submit to the Lord, Ephesians 5 tells us, find out what pleases the Lord. Learn and seek to understand the will of God. Know Jesus, know God, read his word, follow the Lord's leading, follow where he calls you, go where he sends you. And we look at God and we're like, I will follow you wherever you call me, God. And that is the wife to a godly husband. You look at the husband, you're like, I will, I will go, I will follow. <clears throat> In the very curse that happens just a few short verses after the creation of woman, God tells the woman, your desire will be for your husband. This is what is wrong with so many marriages in the church, most specifically. The desire within a woman is to be the leader, is to be in charge, is to usurp the husband, is to undermine the authority. I can do it better. I am more qualified. I understand more. But that is not God's design. The Bible says the husband, the husband will be the desire of the wife and he will rule over you. It's not supposed to be comfortable. That's why we have to look to God. If you try and do this on your own and remove God from the equation, wives, you're not going to be able to submit. Not in submission to the Lord, 
You need to conform to the truth of the word of God. You need to begin viewing the authority of your husband. There is authority over us on the earth. There is authority for women. Fathers are an authority. When you are married, the father ceases to be the authority in many marriages. There is nothing but a comparison game that happens between husband and dad. My dad wouldn't have done that. My dad wouldn't do this. Why aren't you like my dad? Why don't you fix it like dad did? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? You know what kind of man my dad was? You're not a man like my dad. That's bad, wives. If that is your behavior, stop it. He is not your father. And your father is not him. He is now your authority. Your father has ceased to be your authority in marriage. Now you're under the authority of your husband. As unto God. You understand my husband. He isn't a believer. We don't have the same thing in mind. I want to come and worship God and be a Christian and my husband wants to stay home and do nothing. How do you expect me to submit to that? I don't. God does. The final authority for why you are to submit to your husband is the Lord. And I want to remind you of several things as we work through this passage in 1 Peter chapter 3. You can turn there. We're going to be there for just a minute. 1 Peter chapter 3. and chapter 2, you'll remember, uh, we've talked a little bit about how chapter 2 and all of 1 Peter talks so much about suffering. And it is not coincidental to me that coming out of chapter 2 in 1 Peter, having dealt with suffering, Paul, or Peter, a different writer, like take note of that too, I sent you to a different writer within the Bible, I'm even Paul against Peter, he goes into how wives are to live with an unbelieving husband. In the same way, you wives, be submissive, same word, be submissive to your own husbands, so that, pay very close attention, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, you're like, you don't understand my husband, doesn't even believe in God, which is why you must submit to God more than ever. Which is why you must bow your knee, why you must be in prayer, why you must be in the word. You must submit to God because even if they are disobedient, they may be one without a word by the behavior of their wives. You understand, I do everything I can to get him to come and he just won't come. He just won't listen because you are not doing everything you can. It doesn't say that he will be won over. It says that he may be won over. But if your actions don't line up with what God has called you to as a woman, how do you expect him to be won over to anything? You guys, why don't you go to church with me? 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 That's not being a godly wife. It's being a nag. And nobody likes it. Proverbs talks about leaky faucets and boisterous women. It talks all the time about women who are loud and obnoxious. I would challenge you, are you quiet or are you loud and obnoxious to your husband? Are you seeking through the behavior of your wife, the behavior of your life to draw your husband? It says, by the behavior of their wives, without a word, they may be drawn as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. That is to say, your pure and respectful, pure and reverent behavior. It goes on in verse 3, your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry. If I make myself look pretty, he'll do anything I want. Like, Wrong motive. Wrong motive. You are to be subject to the husband. You don't manipulate him. <clears throat> but let it be, verse 4, the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable. That means never going away, never changing, never dying. The imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. I look around the room and there are a couple of women in this room that I have had to look in the eye and say, you need to shut up. I've said it in love. I hope women, I hope you've always received it in love from me. You need to be quiet. You need to live as unto God. Your husband may not be following God, but that does not give you reason to look at him and say, I will not submit to him because then you are contradicting what God has called you to be as a believing, godly woman. I am not going to submit to that. Then you are looking at God and saying, I am not going to submit to that. If you are ready to look at your husband and say, I will not submit to you, then please get somewhere alone with God and look him in the face and say, I will not submit to you either. That's where you stand. Understand the critical nature of where you stand if you do not live in subjection, in submission to your husband. <clears throat> Pure and reverent. If you are undermining, usurping his authority, 
what pure and reverent life are they observing? A pure and reverent life that may lead them to God, may lead them to salvation. <clears throat> All of this passage. Men, have you noticed that nowhere have we read yet? Hold your wives in submission. Make your wife submit. Tell them who's boss. Lord it over them. If you have to tell your wife that she has to submit to you, you have got greater problems than her submission. <clears throat> Wives, be subject to your own husbands, your own husbands as to the Lord. Not any other man, not your father, not a boss, no other man. Subject to your own husband. I will fall in line with him. And then we move on to husbands. And ladies, if you thought I was rough, just pay attention to the guy's stuff. <clears throat> Verse 25, husbands, love your wives. We're going to break this down a little bit. Um, can you go back? Yeah, one more. There we go, right there, right there. We're going to take this verse just a piece at a time. Husbands, love your wives. If you're husband in the room, you're like, got it. I love my wife. She see my paycheck. Put that childishness away. I love my wife. Look at the car she drives. It's great you're able to buy a car. Husbands, love your wives. Have you ever considered what it means to love your wife? Love your wife. Like the flippant use of the word love too, right? I love my wife and I love to hunt. I love to go fishing. I love to hang out with the guys. Like you, you, you lumped that verb connected to your wife with dudes. I, lo I love my wife. I love my wife, do you? Do you know what it means to love your wife? Perhaps you're here now, you're like, you're like I, I, how do I love my wife? Young men in the room, you're like, I wanna be married someday. How do I love my wife? What do I, what do I do in order to love my wife? How do I love my wife? Husbands, love your wives. That is not just bringing home a paycheck. That is not fulfilling the high husbandly duty of procreation in your marriage. I, I don't care if you figured out the mechanics of reproduction. That's a blessing from God if you figured that out that's not loving your wife. That's an aspect of it. Husbands, love your wives. Next portion. Just as Christ also loved the church. Let's qualify love. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. You ever sit down and think about how Christ loved the church? I'm talking about believers in the room. You ever consider how Christ loved the church? John 10.3 tells us, how did Christ love the church? John 10.3 says, tells us that he calls us by name. Jesus, Christ loves us so much that he calls us by name. He, he looks around the room and where I have gaps, Jesus is there saying, I know that person. I know that person. I know that person. He calls us by name. John 10.4 tells us that he leads us. It doesn't leave us trying to figure things out. It says he leads us as a shepherd would lead the sheep is what the passage is talking about. John 10, 11 tells us that he sacrificed himself for us. He says, I'm the good shepherd and I lay down my life for the sheep and you're not gonna find a hired hand that'll do that, but I will. Next part of the verse. Love as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Man, I don't know about you in the room, but I read Husbands Love Your Wives, and I'm like, got it. And then I read the rest of it, and I'm like, man, I'm a failure. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. Did you hear what I said? John 10, 3 says, he calls us by name. Do you know your wife? Or do you have some kind of contract in your marriage? Marriage is not contractual. It is a covenant. It is a commitment. There are vows that the only dissolution in God's eyes is death. Make those vows for life. You don't walk away from them. You don't say, it got too hard. He did this. She did that. We can't ever. You work it out. I gotta calm down a little bit. I'm a little worked up because I met with people today. Man, I tell you what. There are people in the church that want to divorce their spouses and you have to stop. If you're on the verge tonight, if you sit here and you're like, you don't understand my house, you don't understand my husband, you don't understand my wife, the only thing we can do is just get out. No, stop it. Stop God hates it. It causes no good. It fixes nothing. It causes damage and harm that's irreparable for generations. Stop it. No more divorcing in the church. 
Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. He knows the church. He calls them by name. He leads them. Husbands, are you leading your wife? Well, I didn't grow up in church. You know, I don't really know the Bible. I don't really know how to pray. I, then it's time that you find an older man in the church and say, can you help me learn? I have a wife to lead and I don't know what to do. Men, you've got a position to fill in your marriage. Young men, I pay attention to how upset I am with men that are married because I don't want you to get there someday. I want you to follow the word of God. Men, you've got to lead in your marriage. You get up early and you get in the word, you get in prayer, you lead your wife to worship God. You lead your wife in following God. You lead your wife so that your children can see you leading your wife and say, look at that man lead. I'm gonna follow that man as I grow up. Look at him lead. Christ loves the church. Christ sacrificed himself for us. It says, just also as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. When was the last time you gave yourself up for your wife? If husbands would give themselves up more, you would have a beautiful and more beautiful marriage. Like put yourself away, your desires, your dreams, like just put it in a box and put it up on the shelf. I, I tell people, young people, we talked a few weeks ago, like I had dreams before I got married that I didn't see happen. My wife's not gonna diminish them if they happen now. Like now, all the dreams that I had before, I'm like, man, I should have done this when I was single. Like, no, I want my wife to be a part of those now. So I put them away until the time comes that we can embark on some kind of wild adventure. And if you know us, we're crazy people, I guess. But <clears throat> we have goats and chickens, at least. <clears throat> you put yourself away, you give yourself up. Man, you come home from a long day of work, you're like, I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna sit down on the couch here and let you serve me dinner and uh, take care of the kids and I'll see you in bed. I'm gonna go to work tomorrow. That's pathetic. It's just pathetic. And man, am I guilty of it. Boy, are there days I come home and I just don't want to. But when I come home and I see my wife who maybe just didn't want to all day long, Something in me drives me to remember that I may have punched out and left the place that's gonna give me money, but I just showed up to what work is. If you think that work is the place where you go to get a paycheck, you are wrong in your thinking. Work is the marriage at home. I don't care how successful you are. Henry Ford, one of the most successful men in all of history, fascinated by his genius, his design, the things he thought of, his concepts, was a horrible husband and father. They're like, we still there are Ford cars in the parking lot we drive because of Henry Ford. He was a failure in his home. He hated his son. He failed. And if you fail in your home, husband, you have failed everywhere. You have failed everywhere. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up. That means you sit down sometimes and as awkward as it may be, uncomfortable and creaking of the elbow to put your arm around your wife and hold her as though you love her, you do it. You sit quietly while she cries. You do the dishes when she's had a lot. You tell her, you sit down, I'm making dinner. Even if it's ordering pizza, like, be a man. Oh, that guy can't cook anything, he orders pizza. What did you make for dinner? Well, I just, you know, my, 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 my wife. I mean, he's more of a man than you. He's got something more figured out than you. He sat his wife down and said, I care for you. I nurture this relationship. I cherish, cherish this relationship. This relationship on this earth is more important than anything, and I am putting it first. You sit down, and I will care for you. Husbands, love your wives. What, what do, you, do you think that Jesus wanted to go to the cross? Because that's how much he loved the church, right? Jesus died because of his love for the church. And you don't want to do the dishes? Uh, my wife takes out the garbage. You know, I just get up so that's stupid. Take the garbage out. Don't make your wife do. There's some things around the house that you just shouldn't make your wife do. In my house, I'm not going to brag. This is, this is where I place my wife. Sometime get her alone and ask her how often in six years she's had to do dishes in our home. Ask her how often she's had to take the trash out in our home. Ask her how often she's had to go out and do yard work or fix things in our home. Because I don't leave that to her. It's my home too. Men that don't want to take care of their home, that want to shirk responsibilities of being a human, 
Like, I, I don't have time for that. And I don't think God has time for it either. Jesus is like, I died for you, and you don't want to do laundry? Learn. You don't want to open the Bible with your wife? You don't want to pray with your spouse? Learn. Lead them. Teach them. Husbands, future husbands, aspiring husbands, it is not just the paycheck. It is not just the marital intimacy. The love that we are supposed to have for our wives is deep and rich and so strong. Maybe you're married in the room and you have children. I get it. I love my kids. But if I ever, if I ever, ever dare to move them above my wife in the priority scale of my home and my life, it's a disaster. Wives, submit to husbands. Husbands, love your wife. I work hard all day, man. I I work hard all day. I, I shouldn't have to. Yeah, she worked hard all day too. Maybe she actually worked outside of the home too. Like then you're gonna let her work outside of the home and then come into the home and work again and you're gonna sit there? Oh, I don't have time for it. I just, oh man. Okay, let's settle down. Whew, Bible, Bible. Why did Jesus do this? Husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Why? Verse 26, so that he might sanctify her. Jesus Christ loved the church in order to set apart his bride. I want people to know my wife is in the room. I want people to know she's married to me. That's my wife. Can you believe the blessing of God in me? The blessing of God to give me that woman is my wife to walk through life with. I want people to know that. I want her set apart. She's John's wife. That's his wife right there. Set apart. When you walk into the room, guys, do people even know you're married? People even know that you have a wife? I want people to know who my wife is. Jesus wanted people to know who his bride was. The church of Jesus Christ to sanctify her, to set her apart. Verse 26 goes on. Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, making her beautiful. Why? That he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Talking with young adults a few weeks ago, we were talking about, could you imagine if we were all seated in here, a room full, and there's like groomsmen up here, and there's bridesmaids here, and the preacher, and the music, and it's beautiful. Could you imagine if the doors opened and the bride was wearing dirty, muddy rags instead of a dress? Could you imagine that? But husbands, what are you presenting to yourself in the way you love your wife and lead your wife? Is she radiant? Is she pure? Is she holy? Is she blameless because of your leadership in the home? What kind of bride are you presenting to yourself? There was a verse, I'm gonna skip ahead. Erica, I know you're being faithful back there. I normally mix up verses and everything. I'm gonna skip ahead to 1 Peter. Remember that verse we read earlier about husbands and wives and the weaker vessel? <clears throat> someone who's weaker, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives. Well, in, in what way? Well, do you remember what it said to wives back in verse 1 of 1 Peter chapter 3? In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your husbands. Then in verse 7, you husbands, in the same way, in subjection, in submission, what does Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 tell us? Subject to one another in the reverence and fear of Christ. There is an order that you are a part of, husband. In the same way, in that same order, in the order of your wife submitting to you as unto the Lord, you take your position of authority unto God over your wife as one who is weaker, middle of the verse, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. Men, do you ever consider that your actions before your wife may or may not allow your prayers to get to God? I've been praying and praying and praying. I understand. I'm not seeing anything. I'm not, I'm not hearing anything. I'm not seeing anything. There are no results. I pray devoutly every day, all day for this thing, and I see nothing. Well, have you hindered your prayers by not showing your wife honor? 
Is your marital relationship, husbands, wives, is your relationship where God says that it should be? Are you showing her honor or are you hindering your prayers? I think about that in my life. What am I doing that may be hindering my prayers before God? I pray for big things sometimes. I pray for many of you. I pray for my wife, for my children, for our future, for the church, for believers around the world, sometimes critically. And my actions to my wife can hinder that prayer. Man, that's heavy. You just Next time you go to pray, think about that. Husbands, how are you treating your wife? <clears throat> go back to Ephesians chapter 5 and try to come to some kind of place of ending for tonight. Verse 28 says, So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For whoever hated his flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. Verse 29 there, I love that. Nourishes and cherishes. Husbands, realize that is the call to nourish and cherish your relationship with your wife, to cultivate something. You know one of the biggest problems that we see in marriages? People get married, they stand here, take their vows, walk out the door, and they quit dating as soon as they say, I do, and they're Mr. and Mrs. Don't stop dating your wife, husbands, don't stop surprising her with flowers or bringing home chocolate or giving her a kiss or holding her hand. My wife and I laugh about that sometimes. When we were dating, we'd drive in the car and I would hold her hand every single where we went. Now you name it, I was holding her hand. We got married and all of a sudden I didn't hold her hand as much. What's wrong with me? I think it's probably represented in this room. You're probably like, I don't hold my wife's hand anymore. Why? Because you got married and you're like, I got there. I got there. I don't have to pursue her anymore. Yes, you do. Because if you don't, someone out there is trying to. And I have to show that love to my wife because I've got daughters at home. And if I don't show them the proper way for a man to pursue a husband, for a man to pursue, well, whew, for a man to pursue a wife, whew, there's the gap for the night. If I don't show them the proper way for a man to pursue a wife, someday there's going to be someone pursuing my daughters and I want them to be godly. I want them to know when the right man walks up to them. And if I'm not showing them by my relationship with my wife what that looks like, how are they gonna know that? What are you showing your sons and your daughters? Because they're looking at you. I, would, I give the illustration. A couple, there's just a couple guys in the room. I, I, just, I respect them way too much to call it out. A couple guys in the room I have challenged with. If you if you're, had a daughter and all of a sudden her date shows up and he's like, and you open the door, like this is the litmus test for what kind of man you are in your home. Your daughter knocks on the, your, your daughter's date knocks on the door and opens the door and you're standing there. The character of who you are, the character of what you are as a man right now, right here in this moment, are you gonna welcome him in to date your daughter? Or are you gonna shut the door on him? Because if you're gonna shut the door on yourself, then you've got work to do. And your daughter's looking for that kind of man. It's just, I, I can't explain why it happens. It's just how it happens in life. Daughters are going to look for men who are like their fathers. And I want my daughters to find me. And I'm gonna let them go to that man's authority. I'm no longer, baby girl, I'm not the authority anymore. You listen to your husband. He's a man of God. Nourish, cherish, verse 30, because we are members of his body. Christ nurtures and cherishes the church, and that's what we are called to as husbands. Verse 31, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Third time in the Bible those words are said. I think they're important words. A man shall, be, shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. One man, one woman. Uh, the world's full of sin Stop looking at them thinking they understand what marriage is. God's design from the very beginning, Genesis, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, not wives, not another man. Husband, wife, one man, one woman. Said three times in the Bible, Genesis chapter two, verse 24, recorded by Moses when he wrote the first five books of the Bible. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 19, verse five, and here by Paul, 
Three times those words are said in the Bible. I think they're important and they're worth us realizing and understanding. Verse 32, this is a great mystery. But I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Sometimes you attend a wedding and you're like, what's missing here? What is, what's something, what's, what is this? Everything looks right and seems right. And what, what's missing here? And then you realize, the preacher didn't talk about Jesus. The preacher didn't talk about God. The preacher didn't open the Bible in any way. They just had some words that were said and read some vows. And, but where's Jesus? You know, you, you've been to those weddings. I've done those weddings. I'm just like, where's Jesus? The mystery is marriages without Jesus are empty. A marriage without Jesus is empty. It's a great mystery. I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. A church without Jesus is, I don't even know what it is. It's, it's not even empty. It's just a weird bunch of people. Look at you. <laughs> great mystery. Verse 33, nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Love and respect. The two guiding principles, the two main ingredients for a healthy, successful, thriving, godly marriage. And they are not conditional ingredients. Husbands, you love your wives at all times. If you're a husband in the room, there is not a moment in time where you should not be loving your wife. Disagreeing with I love you, but I don't like you right now. There's a disagreement here. We've got to fix something, but I love you regardless. My love is stronger than this disagreement. You love at all times. Wives, you respect, you submit to your husbands at all times. Not conditional. Well, he didn't show me any love today, so I'm not going to respect him. You're breaking God's design. I'm not going to love her today. She, she didn't respect me. I'm not going to love her. You're breaking God's design. He's designed it specifically, carefully, intricately. He's shown you how to live it. He's shown you how to do it. You've got to go after it. Are you willing, husbands and wives, to commit to everything the Bible talks about being as a husband and a wife? If you're a young person in the room, will you aspire to the truth of the word of God to be a husband or a wife in the future? A lot to think about. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for the word. I thank you that it is so contrary to what we see in the world around us. God, just by reading it, I believe and know that it's true because it looks nothing like the world, Father. It's different. I pray that we would be different, that marriages would thrive because they are based on your word. God, that marriage would be a testimony to the grace and salvation of Jesus Christ. That people would observe godly husbands, godly wives, and say, what is it? And they could tell them we believe in Jesus. We're not perfect, but we do what Jesus says to do in our marriage. God, I thank you for the opportunity to open this passage of Scripture tonight. God, help us, men and women, where we fail, husbands and wives, where we are weak. God, help us to strive after your word always. Help us to look into it and pursue it. With everything we have, God, would you honor our life lived before and after your word. God, we love you. Thank you for the night. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week, church.